Um, good morning. Welcome to the Allison Loves Math podcast. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, John Lanza, who specializes in helping parents to raise money smart kids. He's the author of The Art of Allowance, a short practical guide to raising money smart, money empowered kids, and he has and he's the creator of the Money Mammals program, which I'm very excited for you to tell us about. So welcome, John. I'm so excited to have you here today. Thanks, Allison. I'm glad to be here. So let's just jump right in. Will you tell us a little bit about the Money Mammals program? What is it and what inspired you to create it? <laughs> well, it was uh, a question that my uh, wife and I asked uh, now it was over a decade ago when we had our now teenagers were... Uh, well, there was only one of the two, <laughs> and she was very young, and we we just wanted to, we, we asked ourselves, like, how are we going to make sure that they're money smart? And the reason we asked that question is because, you know, my wife was kind of, has been money smart, like, out of the womb. You know, she was that kind of person who bought savings bonds for her nieces and nephews when that was a thing, you know, bought her first car in cash, and I, on the other hand, was, you know, the guy who got the credit card in college and didn't get into too much trouble, but enough to learn that, you know, this is not free money. So you got to be and careful. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of, uh, that was really the, the overriding question was how do we raise our kids to be money smart? Because we knew, because both our, our families were both frugal. Um, so it, it seemed somewhat up to chance and we didn't want a chance as a chance at as much. I mean, we've since learned, I mean, people have very distinct personalities um, in different ways is not much you can control on that. But I think with a, you know, an, an active program of, 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 of talking to kids from the get-go about money, um, you can really kind of get a head start and, and give them a leg up on, on being smart about it. So that's kind of where we started. And then my background happened to be not in finance, but in entertainment. And, oh. you know, so much of what entertainment is, and this was, you know, uh, kids entertainment. I did a lot of animation or worked in animation and it's so much about selling stuff to kids, you know, and we thought, well, let's take those same tools get, to get them excited, not just about, you know, spending money, but spending smart sharing and saving. And that kind of became the mantra of the money mammals who are just this group of fun loving animals who love to share and save and spend smart too, led by Joe, the monkey, his friend pigs, the bank and Clara J Campbell and his sister Marmoset. And they just get kids excited about this idea of being money smart. Right. Right. So did you, did you create these characters with your daughter when she was really little or, you know, how did, how did they come about? Um, there, she inspired them, but uh, she was too young to help create them. <laughs> but she grew up with them. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Cool. And how how have they, you know, impacted her her views on money? You know, have you seen? I don't know. What are your thoughts there? I think it's more the mindfulness, you know, because it's not a matter. You know, parents will say this all the time: is is you know, how do I how do I make sure that they're you know that everything is going to be kind of clear sailing? And it's not that. I mean, the best way to think about money smarts is you know, kind of you have this baseline, right? And it's uh, this will be you know, math oriented, and I'll, I'm sure I'll mm -hmm. bungle it because it's been a long time since I used waves in math. But <laughs> it's very much an up and down. So you want your kids to be along this kind of baseline of money smarts and they're going to make good decisions sometimes and actually good and bad is not the best way to put it they're going to make kind of questionable money decisions that that they have to learn that that are, are good one, you know ones that are going to positively impact them and then they're going to have some negative and they're going to kind of oscillate um, along this kind of you know this this base and th this base i think of as money smarts and they're going to go up and down, but the more you have conversations, the more opportunity they have to practice and learn and kind of stay along that line instead of being kind of stuck below mm -hmm. um, that line, if that makes sense. Oh, it absolutely does. It's, it's a lot like math in that sense of you need to be able to try it out and make mistakes and learn from it. And what part of what I love about your program is it allows kids that early start with it so they can start making those mistakes and learning from it and having those conversations earlier on, you know, rather you know, than Allison, college. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up with the math, math thing, because I mean, obviously this is the Allison loves math podcast, <laughs> but I, I think this is a good, um, it's a good point because so many people um, will say, I'm just bad at math. 
right? That that's just their Drives thing. Me crazy, yes. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I, we were fortunate that um, one of our daughters went to the school. It's very progressive, and they would say, you know, use Carol Dweck's approach, which is, I'm, you know, I'm not a great math student yet, yes. right? That mm-hmm. idea, um, and it's the same way with money smarts because people will think because there are certain personalities that are going to have more difficulty. My personality has more difficulty with being money smart, and I see that in you know in my in one of my daughters and not necessarily in the other. I won't name mm-hmm. which one. This one. <laughs> <laughs> but but I under but the good part is I understand it. Like I understand that that desire to like I really want this, and it's only after you know fifty years of wanting that you realize that getting that thing is not going to make you any happier or it's not going to make, you know, you'll have a, you know, you have a momentary boost, but you're going to habituate to whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so the earlier you start these conversations and giving them some awareness that, that, you know, these things aren't going to necessarily, you know, drive any happiness, you give them the chance to practice and learn for themselves what it is that, how, how they feel as they, you know, they make purchases and they realize Eh, maybe that wasn't a great idea, but the only way they can get through that is through practice. Just like with math, the only way they can figure out um, how to kind of get past this, I'm bad at math or I'm great at math is by, by practicing and learning and realizing, oh, it's, it's really a matter of, it, certainly some people are preternaturally amazing at math, right? But most people are not. And most people can learn something, which is, you know, I know your whole mission. Right, right. And it, and it goes back to, to what you're doing with money about having those conversations with the kids also, right? Because, you know, we have, we say these things like, you know, I'm I'm not good at math yet, right? But they don't know about that yet. And unless they're having conversations with adults who know that and can help them develop that growth mindset and sort of that, that grit to sort of, you know, try and make mistakes, you know, that's not necessarily something that they're going to stumble on upon their own, or at least it makes it a lot easier if, if they have parents or teachers who are talking to them about it. Yeah. And I think the, 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 the beauty of something like yet is that it can seem kind of gimmicky, but I think the beauty of it is not in the, it's, it's helpful in the present, but it's really in the future because one, they're likely to run into other people because that's very much a part of the, the zeitgeist now is like this idea of the growth mindset from Carol Dweck. Um, and if you, and if, if to parents out there who have not read the book, it is so worth the time mindset. It's a very good read and you'll see that the yet actually makes sense. It's not gimmicky at all. And, uh, but they're going to encounter that. They're, they're going to encounter problems down the road. And if they can add that yet to any of those things that they might be interested in, aren't sure or have lack confidence in the fact that in, in the, in the possibility of being good at that. If they can add that yet, it's one of those things that can um, can help pull them along to to success in whatever areas of interest to them. Perfect. And, you know, I'll even add that with yet, we can use that as parents as well, because I think that's one of the things that I'm actually doing with the allowance stuff is, I will admit, my husband and I have not been great about teaching our kids about money. We It's not that we've never had conversations, but we've been inconsistent with it. And you know, but as parents, it doesn't mean that we're destined to be bad at talking to our kids about money. We're just, we're not doing the allowance thing well yet, (laughs) but there's room for improvement, you know? Um, And, you know, so I don't know, what is your advice for parents who are maybe struggling with helping to teach their kids about money and setting up a consistent allowance? You know, my my husband and I, we, um, you know, we we talk to ourselves about saving and what we're doing financially, you know, a lot, Um, but it's something that, you know, maybe it's just because you know, our kids are young. We've got a five and eight and a 10 year old. And it's always hard sometimes, I think, to gauge what is age appropriate for them. Um, so I don't know, what, what is your advice for parents who are maybe struggling with these, these conversations or, or a setup that allows sort of consistent conversation? Sure. Well, you can rest assured that um, the consistency, so I think consistency is you, you want to be consistent over the long haul. You're going to have weeks if you're doing your allowance on a weekly basis where you forget to do it. I mean, we did, (laughs) this is what I, this is what I do. And we still would make those mistakes. Right. Um, I actually think the, really the important part is not getting hung up in those. I mean, you do want to be consistent if you can be that way, but the larger, um, uh, issue you're trying to face is, is comfort, be, becoming comfortable yeah. with money. Right. Mm-hmm. And so much of that is our conversations. And so having as many of those conversations out in the open with your kids, and I'll tell you now, I, 
I'll, I'll give you an idea of why this is important. So we have um, a, my older daughter now is a senior or senior in high school. And so she's looking at colleges and, you know, colleges are ridiculously expensive. Um, but because we've had an open conversation um, about money um, throughout her life, we can have the most, uh, you know, maybe the most, well, it's, it's certainly a very consequential conversation. Okay. So um, for a lot of families, it'll be the most consequential, consequential family uh, or money decision they make, you know, aside from maybe the house. Um, but the, the thing that makes this more consequential is that there's the possibility that your kid might take on a tremendous amount of debt with no context of what that is. Right. And so it, so on a practical side, so we talk to her about how much money we happen to have in the 529. We talk about, you know, whatever scholarship money there is. And we talk, it's a very realistic conversation. Like what is our budget? So, you know, um, it is not an easy conversation because all families are having different conversations. Right. And um, what's difficult about that is that, you know, you just don't, a, a family might be willing, for, first of all, there are going to be families that can easily, um, foot the tab for, you know, $80,000 a year. Um, then there are families that, you know, like us that just cannot do that. And then there are families that um, can't do it and still will do it with tremendous, you know, help on the loan side. And so, you know, all that stuff in the mix, and it just, it's very hard to have those discussions, but getting back to the, to the main point, getting back to your kids, starting early and not worrying about setting up a system so that you're, you're having an open conversation about money is really important. So you had mentioned like, how much do you give them? And a good starting point, and this is by no means like written in stone, do what's comfortable for you, but is a dollar per week per, a, for, for, uh, per age of the child. So a $5 a week for a five-year-old, you know, six for a six and then, and then up. Um, and there's more you can do, a, a, you know, you can add some complexity and responsibility as they get to be 10, 11, and 12, but we don't need to go into that yet. But just getting the money in their hands so they now they can practice with that money. They can start setting and saving for goals, you know, small goals and becoming empowered um, with money in their hands. And guess what? They're going to make mistakes. It's okay. These are low stakes mistakes because just just try, it's hard to do, but just try to picture the future of them. And you're going to be having this conversation about college. And when you're having that conversation, you're talking about stakes that are astronomically high. And even if you've had that conversation, that kid just cannot conceptualize what 25,000 or 50,000 or $100,000 in debt is, right? Like I can barely conceptualize what that is. And you can't understand what that burden is going to be on them when they're you know, done with school. Um, and that's not to say that that doesn't necessarily make sense, depending on kind of the direction you're going um, in your career. But all these things require some context. And having started the conversation early doesn't make it easy, <laughs> but it makes it easier to have those conversations. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. I love everything yeah, yeah. that you're saying. I feel like you, all of this information and these conversations, it sort of bridges the gap between what we teach in math classes and what students actually need. I think there, there's a lot of this that, you know, in math classes, you know, we'll talk about money and maybe adding money and stuff, but a lot of these, these real life conversations, which is really, it's a lot of discussion and it is a lot of trial and error and it is a lot of saving. And like you said, thinking about large sums of money that are hard to wrap your head around as an adult, much less as a child. And so I, I don't know, I think it's, it's very important what you're doing and it can just be helpful to so many, so many kids and so many parents as well. You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the parent side because I think the other uh, wonderful part about um, trying to teach your kids about money smarts is that um, you can engage with your own, you know, issues and use those as kind of a springboard. So, you know, you, you don't have to be an expert. I mean, a, a good example is when, when they get to the point that they might be interested in investing, I am by no means an investing expert, but you can bring that into the conversation and say, listen, you know, we happen to invest mostly in mutual funds and, you know, there is some, and you can talk a little bit about risk, um, but you don't, you can say, 
that's because I've, I've learned over time that I'm just not going to spend all the time that I, I need in order to invest in stock. Does that mean that they have not invested in stock? No, they have invested in some stock. So they've, they've done a little bit of that, dabbled in it, gotten a sense of what it's like. And what's nice about doing that is that, you know, like, for example, my older daughter bought, you know, three shares of a stock um, and it did well. And then we had the conversation um, now in context, in a context that matters to her. So I'm not sitting down with her and saying, well, let's talk about long-term capital gains. Yes. This is, she says, should I sell my stock? And then we can go through the difference between short-term and long-term capital gains. We can talk about, you know, the commission that you're going to have to pay when you sell it. You're, you're going to talk about um, the risk of holding it. If you decide that you don't, you know, you want to, you'd rather pay, you know, long-term capital gains. So those, you, you can't have those conversations without being open to, um, to the overall conversation. And again, I want to stress, like, I, you know, I am not a money expert, but what I, what I am is I understand the importance of having, having a conversation and in talking to lots of people all from the, from the gamut, you know, from uh, that run the gamut, people who are, who are money experts, people who are just, you know, parents uh, like me who just want to help their kids kind of get their head around how to have control of money rather than money having control of them. So much of it boils down to this idea of open conversation. And you can only really, the best conduit to doing that is setting up an allowance for your kids so that they have money in their hands that they can use, that they're empowered to use. And then letting them um, use that money well, within family bounds um, and, 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 they're going to make those mistakes. Mistakes are okay. Right, right. I, I like your conversation with your high schooler. And it sort of reminds me, we've done recently a younger version conversation of that. Our kids got a little bit of money over the holidays you know, from relatives. And we were trying to think of how can we get them to save it instead of just immediately try to go and spend it. And so we've been going back and forth on this discussion about interest. And <laughs> my husband just sort of um, jumped in and said, all right, well, if you save your money for a month, right, if you give it to Bank of Dad, then I will give you 30% interest at the end of the month. And I went, what? And, but it was one of those funny things where sometimes you don't necessarily know how you want to teach your kids about a certain concept. And we thought, oh, it's a great idea to do, you know, to talk about interest. We didn't necessarily have a, a sense of how much interest we should provide them. 30 seems like an insane amount, but at the same time, they didn't have a large amount of money. And if we only did like 2% interest, it would go right over their heads. It wouldn't actually mean anything to them. And so it's been an interesting conversation for us as parents in terms of what we should do on this particular topic. But, you know, as to your point, we've actually ended up talking to our kids about that. You know, how, you know, we, we did 30%, but it's actually insanely high from what you would actually get in real life. Um, but all the conversations that we've actually had that have, you know, come from just this, this decision to talk about interest for them has been really interesting. And yeah, the fact that they have money in there that they're getting interest on is makes it so much more fascinating for them. Yeah. I feel like you, you really do have to goose that interest. So I think you're making the right decision. And, and then as you, as you said, it, it leads to more conversation, but it's really just, it's giving them this idea that, that, it, that makes sense. And there's the problem with current interest rates is they just don't, aren't going to get that point across because the time horizons way too, even with a long time horizon, the interest rates are, you know, they're a joke. You're losing money, keeping your money, you know, in the long term, keeping your money in, in um, those savings vehicles. But um, the nice part, but, but so there's a few things. So one, do exactly what you're doing. And then the other thing is you can look for, you know, youth accounts at various institutions that will have a high interest rate for um, kids up to a certain amount. Like we have, uh, our kids uh, have one that's, I think it's, it was 5% for the first 500 or a thousand dollars. So you, know, you can find those accounts for kids. Oh, uh, cool. But I, I think, but I think the idea of doing it at allowance time. And then the other thing is when you're at allowance time, you can tell them. So, you know, take some of that spend money. You, you don't want them taking all their money and putting it into save because that's mm -hmm. not really, uh, that can happen if they're saving for a goal. Um, but, you know, you do want them to have some spending money, right? That's part right, of life, right. right? None of us are here saving, you know, 50%, yeah, maybe some people are, but, you know, most of us are saving somewhere in the, you know, five to 20% range, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when, when you're at allowance time, you say, listen, uh, take, you know, if you're, if you 
want to do it. So take, you know, take a dollar of that of allowance and put it into the, into the save jar and I'll, you know, I I'll match it. We used to do a quarter for every dollar. Right. Um, and then we can, we also do now we don't, now we don't do the matching, but we do a goose allowance. We do it. a I think it's 3% per month. So they get a decent amount. And then the other thing we do, because is that we, is I met, I mentioned each time because now they're doing a digital allowance. So we don't sit down with the jars that we used to have. I know, I know we're kind of skipping over this, the whole jar setup <laughs> thing, but, uh, but I'll, but I'll reach out to them and say, listen, do you want to ship some money from your spend to your save? Because I'm going to be paying out the interest. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, but that's, you know, like, like you said, you're just, you're having this kind of ongoing conversation and goosing the interest. It's something that came, David Owen has this book called the first national bank of dad. And uh, <laughs> that was the first place that I read it and he made a great case for it. And I couldn't recommend it any more highly. <laughs> so see, see, Allison, yeah. you're doing something totally right. <laughs> <laughs> No, I I like how you mentioned the the jars for the different the save and share and spend. Which actually, let me backtrack to that. Even I, yep. one of the things that I love about your your book and your program as well is that it's not just focused on saving, right? Because I feel like that's a lot of times is, or at least for my husband and I, that's what we were thinking of in terms of teaching our kids. And as I was reading your book, I I realized the importance of the share aspect because again, that wasn't something that we were necessarily having. A conversation that we were having with our kids because my husband and I, we would know we're taking out a certain amount every quarter and we're dedicating that to um, giving, but it wasn't a conversation that we were actually having with the kids. And I love that you take it even a step further than that is that you're teaching the kids to do that as well. So I don't know, what are some tips or advice that you have for families to teach their kids about giving as well? Yeah. So I'll say two things. So let's go back to the jars quickly. So the, the way to get this set up, say you have a five-year-old is you set up a share jar. That's for charitable giving. You set up a save jar and that's for saving for longer term items. And for a younger kid, longer term item is something that's going to take, you know, three to, you know, eight weeks. It's not that long. Right. The big toy. Um, yeah, exactly. The big toy. Um, and then you have the spend, we call it the spend smart jar, just so that you're kind of, it, it's, it's, it's just so they're thinking about it. Um, and then you allocate that. So what we did for a five-year-old is we'd put $1 in the share jar, right? So that's kind of talking, that's, that's, it's a way of kind of communicating values. You think that's important to your family is giving to charity. $1 in the save jar. It's a way of kind of teaching them this concept. And you don't tell a five-year-old this, but you're teaching them this concept of paying themselves first, right? And then $3 would go in the spend smart jar. And you could break that up. That, that's, you know, that turns out to be, you know, 60%, 20%, 20%. People, you could do it 80, 10, 10. We were just too lazy and we just wanted $5. So we just do it like that. We usually break it up by dollars, but you could do it with coins, however you want to do it, right? Um, the point is that you have have allocations in the jars. So getting, and, and then you can increase that as they get older. Um, getting to the share jar, um, what's nice about that is now that they're accumulating money in the share jar, their decisions to donate are not, um, opportunity cost decisions for for against uh, uh, opportunity. They're not they're not opportunity costs um, for spending. So in other words, they mm -hmm. can't spend that money on something else. So we just had this conversation last night. We were looking at how much they have in their share accounts, their digital accounts now, uh, because there is uh, there's there's some community fridge that they're going to be donating material, so donating food to, right? And so they were just trying to figure out, you know, how much money each of them has in share. And the fact that they have it already allocated means they're not thinking, oh, well, that's, that's, I'm, I'm not going to get a pair of Converse. I'm going to share the money. The money has to go to that. And that's, that's a lesson that I hope they carry forward into, into their adulthood. And if nothing else, they're, they'll be thinking about it, right? So as mm -hmm. they get their first, you know, big paycheck, uh, that is not to say that they're going to do everything right from that standpoint, fr from, from uh, that point on. But it is to say that they now have some experience with the fact that Every time you're getting some money, you're making a choice, whether that is an active choice to split it up like an allowance or whether it's a passive choice, like getting some money from babysitting and sticking it in your wallet, right? Um, 
they're thinking about the fact that there, there are choices to be made with that, with that money. And we are making those choices all the time. So um, the, I, one of the, the beauty of that, having that share jar is that then that money is available for the opportunities that will come up, whatever. And for a younger kid, that could be, you know, UNICEF um, at Halloween or, you know, whatever if, at, at your elementary school, they're usually collecting for something, you know, whether mm-hmm. it might be disaster relief or whether it might be support for um, some program, those opportunities are there. And the share jar gives them the opportunity to take advantage of those opportunities. Right. And it gives them a chance to think more about them and be active participants in the giving instead of mom and dad just donating to the programs at school and donating to this. You know, they don't necessarily think about it or realize what it is or I don't know. It's I I like the idea of getting them more actively participating and thinking about all of that. Yeah, I would say like you beat your you're beating yourself up about consistency, and I would say the area where where I feel um, I beat myself up uh, the most is that there are so many hidden decisions that you make as a parent that the more transparent you can be about those decisions, you know, whether it's you know giving your own charitable giving, you know, because I, and I think so, some of this is driven by this this idea that you're not supposed to talk about charitable giving. Um, but you should definitely be talking about it um, within your family so that they know that like, you're not just telling them to use something from your jar. You're doing it yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and another example of this, of these, uh, um, uh, these hidden conversations that, that kids aren't aware of is, you know, if you, for example, buy a new car and then you want to tell them that you're not going to, you know, indulge them in a Jamba juice because they, they could use their own money to buy that Jamba juice. They look at you like you just spent $27,000 on a car or whatever it is. Right. But they don't realize that you made a decision not to spend $50,000 on a car. Right. And the numbers here don't matter. The point is like there are huge amounts of money and you are making a decision. And the more you can share that with them, uh, you know, if you can share that with them, that can be very helpful. Right, right. And the allowance also allows them to then think about the money that's spent on Jamba Juice, because when they're taking that out of their own money, they actually think about what that costs too. Yeah. And that doesn't mean they're not going to be, oh, I bring up Jamba Juice because my older daughter was begging us to buy them Jamba Juice (laughs) after practice yesterday. I said, listen, you're welcome to walk to Jamba Juice. That's why you get an allowance. (laughs) And Oh, the other point is it does also does not mean that you cannot indulge your kids from time to time. Like that's because right. people will ask that. It's like, do well, you know, wait, can you, can I buy them an ice cream? I'm like, of course you can buy them an ice cream. <laughs> 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 you know, if you're on vacation, I mean, another rule that we follow is, you know, if they have a friend over and they walk to it's kind of local boulevard um, that has, you know, food and stuff and, and if they, uh, and, and we would be the ones providing dinner, um, but their kid, you know, their friend comes over and, you know, and, and um, we're not providing dinner, we're just going out, we'll pay for their dinner, right? You know, those kind of things. Whereas if they're just going out and meeting some friends for, you know, coffee or lunch, whatever, whatever it is, that's part of their budget that they've got. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like, I like your advice that, it's okay to make mistakes, right, as a parent. And there's just a lot of flexibility. There's not one set path, perfect way to teach your kids about money. Um, yep. I think is very encouraging as a parent. I'm sitting here feeling like, you know what? This is great. I can start having these conversations. I can try stuff out. Yeah. I don't have to stress myself out about getting everything perfect every time. It's just the the fact that you're you're trying to do those things that and have those conversations that that counts. Yeah, and just think about everything as uh, guidelines, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like there are three core money smart skills that we talk about uh, in the book. And those are, you know, distinguishing between needs versus wants, um, setting and saving for goals. And then like we already talked about this idea of making smart money choices, right? And so, you know, if you're ever feeling overwhelmed, you go back to those things and those are simple things to communicate, right? Mm-hmm. And there's simple things to, you know, if, we, if we're having trouble in our own lives with those things, they're, they're fairly simple things to fix, Mm-hmm. Um, so that you can be, cause you know, uh, there's a big component of financial literacy and money smarts, and that is experiential learning. That's a lot of what we've talked about here, making those mistakes. But another big part is this idea of financial socialization, right? So that's mm-hmm. the modeling 
that we provide to the kids. And we do want to be decent models for them. And there's, there, there's kind of two things that I think about with this. And that's one is interactual, you know, if we're, if we're providing proper modeling, that's, that's great. And if we make mistakes, sharing some of those mistakes, like I was talking about with, with regard to, uh, with investing, you know, and realizing uh, over time that I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just not interested in spending lots of time on, um, uh, on the research that would be required to, to invest in individual stocks. So we do uh, the fun side. Right. That doesn't mean, you know, that's, and if your kids really may be interested in it, then find someone that you know who is an expert to help them out or give them any of these books. You know, Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor. You give them um, Your Money in Your Brain by Jason Zweig. Um, you know, those are, those are, uh, those are two great books. And I, I'm sure there are some others that I'm uh, thinking of. Another great book for kids. About, this is for more adult kids is Ramit Sethi's um, I Will Teach You to Be Rich. And um, I don't like the title because you have to read the book to realize it's not, he's not really talking about rich money. I mean, he is to some extent, but the rich um, has to do with uh, your life um, as much as it has to do with money. Right, right. And um, I guess just to end, let's share a little bit about your book and then the program. Um, so that way people can find your book and find out how, how you can help them with all of these things. Sure. Yeah. So it's called the art of allowance. And I, I, you know, I, I wrote it for parents. It's a short guide and their guidelines. I call it the art because your path, Allison, is going to be different than my path, which is different than, you know, every other family's path, right? So there are guidelines on how you can make this all work. There are very specific tips and tactics, you know, the idea of incentivizing that we talked a little bit about and um, an idea of, called the waiting period, which is you know, this idea that you want to hold, you know, if, if there's something they really want and they don't have the money, they, or they do have the money, but they might have to wait a week before they buy it just to avoid impulse purchases. So there's lots of good tactics in there, but overall the, the, the main, uh, you know, the main through line of the book is just, you know, teaching them the basics um, of how to be money smart and to understand that it's a very flexible system. Right. And, and um, I'll yeah. also add that it's a very friendly book. You know, I think that sometimes as a parent, you might think that like, oh, a book on allowance, it just seems like it would be terrible to read. Um, but it is just one, it's very helpful. It does really streamline, you know, this um, save and share and spend concept that you were talking about and sort of how to implement that with kids. But it's just sort of like the way that this conversation I feel like has just been, it's like helpful and friendly and it makes it a fun adventure for parents. Um, the book is really along the same style. And, you know, so if you're thinking about learning um, about setting up allowance and having more conversations with kids about money, I think it's a really, really good book to check out. So I highly recommend it. Uh, well, thank you, Allison. That's uh, fantastic. I appreciate that. Um, and the other thing we're doing now is we're, oh, we're what's that? I said, oh, and then the money mammals. You can't forget to tell us more about that. Yes. Also. Go. Yeah. So the money mammals, that, that, that's how we kind of got into this. The money mammals get kids excited about money, smart learning. Um, and we actually have a program that we're launching um, in March called the Art of Allowance Project. So we work with um, financial institutions across the country. So if you're, you know, look around uh, and you may find uh, it's the money mammals program now, but it's going to be the Art of Allowance Project program featuring the money mammals. Then we're also going to have material for tweens and teens. And the whole idea here is get kids excited. And then the art of allowance is helps parents kind of capture that excitement and turn it into a plan. And um, so I'm really excited about that, uh, that launch, because it's, it's, it's really kind of taking the, the book a whole nother kind of step further. And, um, and it'll be, a, it'll be really a chance for parents to, to answer, you know, hopefully all of the questions that they might have as they go through the process and, you know, walk them through the program um, as they, you know, go, go about this process of trying to teach their kids to be money smart. Awesome. That sounds fantastic. I'm excited to learn more about that. Great. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming here today. This was really, really interesting talking with you about all of this and, um, yeah, I don't know. Thank you so much. Well, Allison, thanks for having me on. And I appreciate you uh, uh, sharing, uh, you know, your own uh, tribulations with the allowance on, on with regard to allowance, because it's, it's something we all encounter. And we just have to know that 
we, we want to engage with this conversation with our kids. And that's, that's, that's what I hope comes across to, uh, to your audience. So thanks again for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. And thank you so much for listening. And I will see you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.